Thank God for the Word of God. Amen? Hallelujah. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Acts, the very first chapter. Acts chapter 1. We're going to begin in, very, in the very first verse, Acts 1, verse 1. And we find some truths here. And actually, if you just take verse 1 and take a moment and look at it, which we will, verse 1 actually sets up the entire rest of this book. It sets up the entire work of the kingdom of God. It sets up what we're supposed to be doing right now. In Acts 1, verse 1, and you know, Luke is the writer here, and he's, he's talking to us. And he says, the former treaties or account have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Well, he's talking about the gospel of Luke. He wrote about the Lord Jesus. But notice something that he says here. He says, all that the Lord Jesus began to do and to teach. Jesus did this and he taught this. Amen. But notice the other word there. Jesus began to do and to teach. Doesn't say Jesus finished all this. It says he began all of this. Amen. Meaning what? Oh yeah, the work of redemption is finished. Jesus Christ paid the full price. Salvation is a plan that is available to everybody right now. Jesus already triumphed over death, hell, and the grave. He's already redeemed us from the curse, and he's Lord. But his work is not finished on the earth. He began the work. Amen? And so the book of Acts is a continuation of the work of Jesus Christ after his resurrection. That means you and I are supposed to be involved in it. That means it's for you and me to grab a hold of. If he began it, we get the opportunity to continue it. Amen? And if Jesus did it, we should do it. And if Jesus taught it, we should teach it. Praise God. Can I have a good amen? amen. Now notice here he goes on and he says in verse 2, Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Notice this, that, that Jesus spent 40 days, he'll go ahead and tell you here in a moment, and he ministered to the disciples, but he gave them commandments. You know the two main commandments that the Lord Jesus Christ gave the, the disciples during that time after his resurrection and his ascension? The main commandments he gave is in Matthew 28, go in all the world, make disciples of all the nations. In other words, be a soul winner. Take the gospel out. Tell people about the resurrection. Tell them about the good news that they can be saved. And the other commandments, Luke chapter 24, when he said, Tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Amen. The two things that the Lord Jesus was constantly teaching and commanding his disciples throughout the gospels and throughout his time, even after his resurrection, was this, that they were supposed to be fishers of men and that they needed to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. They needed the Holy Spirit. They needed the power of God. God wanted them to be brought into His work. And He wanted the people there to be brought into a walk of the Spirit. Praise the Lord. So He says in verse 3, To whom also He showed Himself alive after His passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Notice this, Jesus gave them many infallible proofs that He was alive. Why did Jesus appear so many times to the disciples? Was it He was just wanting to come back and forth? No, He was reassuring them that I am alive. He was reassuring them that, the, that sin has been conquered. He was reassuring them that he had defeated death and he was the resurrected Lord. He came back. He showed them his hands. He showed them his side. He showed them his feet. He, he ate with them. He walked with them. He taught with them. He ministered to them. Why? Because he wanted them to be totally, completely convinced that, that he was Lord and that he was alive and he was real and that all he had done was there. And, and then why? Because they were supposed to take this gospel out. These were the forerunners. These were the, the apostles of the Lamb. These were the, the, those who were laying the foundation, praise God. And they were to go and convince everybody else. And so the Lord was convincing them that they could do this, praise God. But even with the Lord Jesus showing himself to them, even with the Lord Jesus giving them many infallible proofs that he was Lord and he was alive and that he had conquered death and that, 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 that you know, he would had his resurrection body. With all of this that he showed them, notice the next two verses. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith, you have, your, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence, or many days from now. Now, notice this. Even though the Lord has spent 40 days teaching them things pertaining to the kingdom of God, 
reminding them of his commandments, he, till, he still tells them, you need to stay right here and wait until you receive the promise of the Father, which you heard me teach you about. You need the Holy Ghost. Meaning what? I don't care how much, uh, how many signs you see. I don't care how many wonders you experience. I don't care how many supernatural experiences in your life. You cannot build a solid Christian life based upon just signs and wonders all the time. You need a consistent, constant walking in the Spirit, knowing that God is real in your heart. Not just because you saw Him, not just because you heard Him, but because He came to live inside of you. Amen? We need the walk of the Spirit. And so then the disciples in verse 6, I wasn't going to read this, but look what he says in verse 6 and 7. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will you this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, he's teaching them the things of the kingdom of God. And he turns to them and says, now, wait a minute. Even though I've showed you all these things, you need to stay put until you receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. You need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And immediately they want to get off track. And they say, now, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom right now? And so the Lord looks to him in verse 7 and says, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. In other words, that's not really of importance right now to you. See, you don't really need to know who the Antichrist is. You don't really need to know, you know, when is he going to show up and what nation did he come from and, and, and is he alive on the earth today? And, and is it about time for rapture? So many people get caught up with end times and all this other stuff and they forget what the real purpose of being a Christian is all about. And so the Lord redirects them back to the primary of what he's wanting to get across to them. He redirects them back to the very purpose of which he came. In verse 8, he says this, but you shall receive power. The word power there can also be translated authority, praise God. But it can also be translated ability. It can also be translated efficiency. It can also be translated might. So he says, but you're going to receive power, authority, ability, efficiency, and might after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you'll do what? And you'll know when the end times come. And you'll know who the Antichrist is. No, no. And you shall be witnesses unto me. Notice that. Come on, give me a good amen, somebody. Everybody shake yourself and wake up this morning. It's too good for you to sleep through. Hallelujah. Notice what he says here. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. Glory to God. What's he saying? He's saying, I want to remind you of the reason I came. I came so everybody on this planet could be delivered from their sin and brought into a righteous walk with Almighty God. Are you listening to me? And Jesus began to do and teach this when he came. What was the very first thing the Lord Jesus did after he came out of the wilderness and, and he came out in the, in the power of the Holy Ghost? He began to preach to the people, repent for the kingdom of God is near you. It's ready. It's right here at hand. You can come out of darkness into light. You can be delivered from your sins. Hallelujah. What did John say in John 3? He said in verse 16, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. Why? So that everybody that believes on him and give their life to him can be saved and be delivered from their sins and not perish and go to hell. Amen? So therefore, the purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ in coming to this earth, in, in 1 John 3, he says that he came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to deliver and set people free. He came to teach you the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. It's coming into right standing with God. It's having peace in your heart, knowing that you're saved and that you're not going to hell anymore. And it's having the joy of salvation in your life every day of your life. But folks, there's more to the kingdom of God than you just getting saved. Jesus gave commandments to the disciples, and those commandments are still our commandments today because they were not just commandments to the 12 they were commandments to the church so what is he saying here he's saying this don't get distracted don't get your eyes off of things that 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 are going to take care of themselves everybody says what's your what's your theory on 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 the rapture i always tell them i have the pan theory and they say what do you mean the pan theory it'll all pan out in the end hallelujah amen Huh? Because it's going to happen whether or not you think it is or not. It's going to happen when God decides it's going to happen. Praise the Lord. Well, shouldn't we be getting ready for it? Well, you should be getting ready every day to live for Jesus. 
what are you going to do? Wait until the last minute and then get ready? Huh? It's not like, you know, you just got saved so you can take a trip. Some people, you know, they, they remind me, they act like Christianity. They're, they're getting ready to go someplace. And they wait till the very last second to start getting ready. And then they got to rush around. And they're putting on, you know, the women are putting on their makeup in the, in, in the car coming. Praise God. Huh? Hallelujah. Well, as the fellow said, you know, I think heard the joke the other day. Said said the guy was driving and said one was swerving all over the road. And said, you know, he finally got around her and she, she was putting on makeup in one hand and had a phone in the other hand. He said, no wonder she's swerving. She swerved so much. He said, you know, he almost made me spill my cereal as I was eating it on the way to work. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know. Everybody's trying to get ready for the last minute deal. Amen. But no, praise God. What's he saying? He's saying this. You need to get ready every morning. The Lord is saying you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost because there's a great purpose for you on the planet right now. And your purpose isn't just to get saved and go to heaven. I mean, if that were the case, I'd do you all a favor and hold you under a little bit longer whenever we baptize you. Amen. We just bring you up and pray for you until you quit bubbling and just get you saved and send you on. Hallelujah. No, you got saved and got baptized. Why? So that you could live for God. And that's what the Lord is trying to get across to the disciples. I'm looking for people who will live every day for me. And I need you to be filled with my, my spirit every day. And I need you to understand what your purpose is every day. And I need you to understand that I came here to enlist you into my work. And my work is to take this gospel to all the nations of the world. Start where you're at and just keep on expanding it, praise God. And we see the Lord ca- uh, you know, causing this to come to pass throughout the book of Acts. They were filled with the Holy Spirit then on the day of Pentecost. And then they're preaching to the Jewish people. And then in the 8th chapter, there's a great persecution. And they get scattered. And then they start going out to Samaria. And then you go on down to the 11th chapter. And they start preaching out in other places. And all of a sudden the, the Jews begin to, to, to take the gospel out to the Gentiles. And, and Cornelius' household there in the 10th chapter. And then, then you know, uh, Cyprus and different places. And all of a sudden the gospel is being preached everywhere. And God raises up the Apostle Paul. And he begins to tell the, the Gentile nations, you are in right standing with God just like the Jewish people were. In fact, in Christ, now you're the seed of Abraham. And you get to walk in this. And so the commandments that the Lord gave and the things that the Lord gave here in Acts chapter 1 are the things that are important to Him. And what is important to the Lord is this. Not you trying to get ready for rapture, but you getting ready to be a witness. Not you just hoping you make it to heaven someday, but how many people can you influence to go to heaven with you someday? Are you listening to me? And he wants you to walk in the Spirit. He wants you to walk in the power of God. Christianity is not supposed just to be a weak little, you know, a fundamental uh, religious act that you do once a week on Sunday morning. But Christianity is you walking with God, walking in the Spirit of God, being a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ in how you live and how you talk and where you go and what you do. Amen? And Jesus said here, you need the Holy Spirit to help you to do that. Now, look in Acts chapter 2. Let me show you something. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. These people got in one accord. Then they went to the place where the Lord told them to go. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. These people were sitting there. They'd been fasting and praying and seeking God. And now, as they're sitting, they're just like we're sitting here this morning, and, and, and they're ministering. The Bible says that the Spirit of God came in like a mighty rushing wind, and, and they heard this sound coming around. And then suddenly there appears unto them cloven tongues, or divided tongues like as a fire, and it sits upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Notice this, there's a supernatural act going on here. God fills them up, and all of a sudden, they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin to worship God in a heavenly language, and they begin to praise God. But they didn't just stop there with their singing and praising and worshiping God in tongues. They took that outside of the upper room. They left. See, you come to church, folks, to get filled up with the anointing. You come to church to get encouraged. You come to church to hear who you are in Christ so that you can walk out of here filled with the Spirit, praising God, walking in the anointing so you can go share it with the rest of the world. Hallelujah. There ought to be a change takes place in you. You know, just because the battery's low doesn't mean it's bad. Sometimes you have to recharge them. Amen? 
And that's what church, and that's what the Word, and that's what refillings are. It's to charge you up. Sometimes we get a little down. We think, well, we're backslid. We're not doing it. Maybe you're just tired. And you need a recharge. Hallelujah. See, what you've got to understand is this. Your purpose is to shine the light of Jesus Christ unto the world. And folks, I want to tell you something. We cannot win this world by just living a good life. Well, I'm going to live a nice life. I'm going to live a good life. I'm going to be a nice person. I'm going to, I'm going to live a, you know, be a good person. And why, by being a good person, people will want to be saved. No, they won't. That philosophy has been peddled around here now for the last 15 or 20 years. Don't be abrasive. Don't go out here and witness. Don't go out here and tell people, oh, Jesus, don't be offensive. You're too abrasive. You're going to drive people away. Well, that's amazing. We have right now about 16% of this nation. That was four or five years ago on, in church on Sunday morning. So apparently we're not doing something right. Our living a nice life is not bringing people to Jesus. You know what we're doing? We're compromising. We're being quiet. We're not convicting them anymore. We're not being somebody that they have to deal with anymore. And that's what the devil wants. He wants you to be a nice, quiet Christian. So you don't provoke anybody. There used to be some persecution. There used to be you know, mockery. There used to be a, a, a people being attacked because they stood for principle and they stood for the word and they stood for the things of God. And, and, and I've noticed today there's not a whole lot of criticism going on. That's right. Not a whole lot of persecution going on. But when I read the book of Acts, they were always being persecuted. Why? Because they weren't trying to win people by a lifestyle. They were winning people on purpose. See, you've got to be a Christian on purpose, folks. Are you hearing me? You, you do things on purpose. I read the Bible on purpose. I pray on purpose. I witness to people on purpose. I preach on purpose. I praise God on purpose. Amen? In other words, I don't just do it. I do it with a purpose behind it, praise God. I believe in God. I believe in the Word of God. I believe in the truths I'm presenting to you. And I want to live a life that is a purpose-filled life. Amen? And if we're going to win Christians, win people to Christianity and bring Christ to this nation, we have to do it on purpose. How many of you ever got paid for working in your job when you just showed up? I'm here, pay me. You had to go do something on purpose, didn't you? Huh? When the guy says, go do this, what do you do? You have to go do that. Well, if you don't, you don't get paid, do you? Huh? Anybody here get paid for not doing anything? You, you know, I got a job. Well, I hadn't seen you leave the house for the last five days. Well, you know, I, just because I got a job doesn't mean I should have to get up there in the mornings. Clean up and get ready and go to work. I mean, you know, I've got a job. What else you expect of me? Well, if you don't get up on purpose... How many of you know if, if, if you've, you know, you've been busy and the alarm goes off at 530 in the morning? You know, most people, now there may be some in here that do it, but I'm not one of them. Most people at 530 in the morning, that alarm goes up, you don't jump up and go, Whoa, hallelujah, it's time to get up and go work. Most of you have to get saved again after you smash that, the clock two or three times. Huh? No, you have to get up on purpose, don't you? Amen. In other words, you make yourself get up. You cause yourself to get up. You respond and do what you have to do on purpose. It's not because you, it's the most fun thing in the world, but it's the purpose that you have. And you have to do that. Well, guess what, folks? Being a Christian is something you should be doing on purpose. And that's why the Holy Spirit comes. He gives you the power to live for Christ on purpose. Are you listening to me? He gives you the power and the ability of God. He gives you the anointing of God. He gives you the efficiency of God, the might of God, so you can go out and on purpose be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. What's that mean? That means that you and I, if we get filled with the Holy Spirit, and we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, and we live a Spirit-filled life, and we begin to grab a hold of the teachings that Jesus brings across here, and the things that He shared pertaining to the kingdom of God, in the mornings when you get up, you ought to pray and say, Lord, today, give me an opportunity to witness to somebody. 
I am going to be on purpose witnessing to somebody today. I'm going to do it on purpose. I'm going to do it. It's going to be a cause in my life. I'm not just going to go through my life today and forget I'm a Christian and forget people are dying and going to hell and forget that, that you know Jesus came and gave his life and Jesus took my place on the cross and Jesus was punished for my punishments and Jesus was raised up so I could be justified. I'm not going to forget that today. Holy Spirit, I ask you to come into me and anoint me and today help me to be a witness for the Lord on purpose. Give me a cause. See, a lot of Christians today, we've, we've forgotten our purpose. We've forgotten our cause. I think a lot of Christians are sitting around today twiddling their thumbs hoping rapture takes place tomorrow. We're kind of like the disciples here. Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom? Lord, are you coming back? When, when's this going to thing close up? Lord, I'm kind of ready to go. And then there's some others, if you preach about rapture, they're so carnal that they get scared out and they say, Oh, God, I hope not. Amen. I've talked to people about the Lord coming back and they go, Oh, I hope not. And then you get to talking to them and you find out they like what they're doing. They, they like their life and they, and, and they like the carnality that they're in. And, and then some of them, they don't want the Lord to come back because they've got family and friends that aren't ready yet, but they're not doing anything to get them ready. Somebody says, what got in you? The Holy Ghost. <laughs> See, this is the purpose of the church. This is what we're supposed to be living about. Listen, church, these people in the book of Acts surrendered and sold themselves out to this. I mean, you read on down in the second chapter of Acts here. And, and when these people got filled with the Holy Spirit, they didn't just leave it at the church. They took it home with them. In fact, let, let's, you know, let's just look at it a moment here. Verse 41, well, you know, Peter stands up and preaches a powerful message to these people. I mean, look what the Holy Spirit did for him. The Holy Spirit takes Peter, who was a, a man who was fearful, a man who was a little selfish, self-centered. He was bold in some areas, but at the same time, he, was, he had some real problems. He denied the Lord. In a moment of crisis, he denied the Lord. And it was so bad that after Jesus was raised from the dead and he appeared to some people, he gave specific instructions for one of them to go and tell Peter that I'm alive and I'm okay. What was he doing? He is reaffirming to Peter, even though you messed up, I'm, I, don't, I don't hold anything. It's okay. I understand you weren't ready at that moment. And Peter's right there on the day of Pentecost in the upper room. He gets filled with the Holy Ghost. And what's he do? They're all mocking. And that's one reason we aren't being filled with the Holy Spirit today. Because I'm going to tell you something. You get filled with the Holy Spirit. And in this region we live in. And across this nation right now. Because this nation's gotten religious, folks. And no, nobody's preaching a baptism in the Holy Ghost. Nobody's preaching speaking in tongues. Nobody's preaching the power of God. Why? Because we're trying to grow crowds. And we want to make sure we don't offend anybody. And if you get speaking in tongues, you know what's going to happen? You're going, you're going to get a little persecuted. Why? Because they're going to think, well, you've gotten that crazy stuff. And you've gotten over in that wild stuff. And that's wildfire. You better not go down there. You know, well, the greatest times we've had here in this church is when everybody was telling everybody not to go here because you'll get filled with the Holy Ghost. That's right. And so right now, across this nation, you, you're going to get persecuted. If you, if you get filled with the Holy Spirit today, if you say, God, I want everything you have for me, and you come and, 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 and we pray for you, and you get filled with the Spirit, and you receive prayer language, I'm going to tell you what, you're going to get persecuted. Family's going to look at you. And then Christians around. Because see, a lot of the church today is lukewarm. And a lot of the church today is in a feel-good thing. A lot of the church today is more interested in verses uh, you know, 6 and 7 in Acts chapter 1 than they are in verses 4, 5, and 8. They're more interested in establishing the kingdom. Let's all come together and let's feel good. And let's get ready for rapture. And let's live our best day and our best life right now. And let's be good people right now. And let's enjoy life right now. And don't make waves right now. We don't want to offend these people, the millennials that they're talking about. You know what I'm talking about? The millennial generations coming up, the 20s. 4% are giving their hearts to Christ. We better start offending somebody. Jesus offended people. The apostles offended people. Disciples offended people, but they got multitudes saved because for everyone that fussed, there was 
a hundred of them getting their lives to Christ. Why? Because people recognize if you're willing to stand up for your conviction and stand up for the word and stand up for Jesus and willing to be persecuted, then it must be real in your life. So Peter stands up under the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And multitudes are walking around going, these people are drunk. These people are nuts. These people are crazy. Look, listen to those crazy things. Wait a minute. That's not crazy. They're praising God over there. I heard them speak in my own language that Jesus is Lord. Well, they don't talk my language. How do they do that? What's going on here? This, this is confusing. And so in the midst of all this, what does Peter do? He steps up and he says, listen, 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 listen. We're not drunk like you suppose. This isn't crazy stuff like you think. Let me tell you what's going on here. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. That in these last days, these things would be done. And Jesus would pour out his spirit. The anointing would come. And, and the power of God would set people free. And anybody that would call on Jesus' name would get saved. He comes and shares the gospel in boldness. And they recognize the boldness. They recognize the authority. They recognize the power. What's given him the power? The Holy Spirit has come upon him. He's living in the Spirit. He's walking with God now. And he understands what Jesus was teaching. Because, you see, the Holy Spirit comes and reminds us of what Jesus taught. The Holy Spirit comes and shows us what Jesus taught. The Holy Spirit comes and says, here's what the Lord came for. And here's what your purpose in life is for now. And so Peter stands up and preaches. And the Bible says that his words cut their hearts. And they turned to Peter and they said, well, what, what do we need to do? And he said, repent and be baptized. And, and, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit too. Your life will be changed too. God will do great things in your life. And the Bible says here in verse 41, Then they that gladly received his word and were baptized that same day, and there were added to them about 3,000 souls. Glory to God. Peter got up and offended people and got 3,000 of them saved. Peter stood in the power of the Holy Ghost and got people set free. Listen to me, folks. We're here for a purpose. We're not candy. This is not the candy club. We are the salt that is supposed to be poured into this world. And salt sometimes stings when it goes in. But I want to tell you what. You know, if you get an ulcer in your mouth, you don't rinse your mouth out with sugar water. You rinse your mouth with salt water. Why? The salt will sting it. The, you put that warm salt water and you swish it around in there. And if you've got a little sore spot on the inside of your mouth, you know what will happen? It will burn like the dickens. But you know what it will do? That salt will help heal it up. And sometimes we have to burn like the dickens to get some people set free from the bondages and the hurts they're in. Amen? But God said that we're to be the salt that is to be poured in. So 3,000 people got saved because somebody on purpose stepped up in the power of the Holy Spirit and told them the truth. Wasn't abrasive. Wasn't mean. But in love, he spoke truth to them. With conviction and purpose, he spoke truth to them. In the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit, he spoke truth to them. And they received it. And let me tell you what they did after they got saved. Let's read verse uh, 42. And they went home and forgot everything they learned at church. No. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking bread and in prayer. You know we need all that. You understand that? When you get born again, you, you, you need to stay in the Word. And guess what you also need? You need fellowship with other believers. Guess what else you also need? You, you, you need to, uh, to be in church, praise God. And you need to learn to pray. See, this is what the Holy Spirit comes to do. He comes to help us to stay connected and stay anointed and stay empowered. You and I need each other, but at the same time, we need to be telling others of the good things that God has given to us. Now look what he says. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. That word fear, that doesn't mean they were afraid like you're afraid of a snake. It's reverential fear. A respect for God. The Holy Spirit also represents the Father and the Son to us. And, and He brings respect and honor of God into our lives. And let's read on. And it says, and they all believed and had everything together and had everything in common. They got in unity, got in one accord. They sold their possessions and goods and part of them to men as they had need. They became givers, praise God. See, when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, instead of being a taker, you want to be a giver. 
See, the character of God is giving, not, not taking. It's not what's in it for me. It's, it's how can I be a blessing to somebody else? That's why you need to be filled with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will help you to, to take your center of your life off of you and center it on Jesus and helping other people, praise God. And that's the purpose He came. Jesus didn't come for Himself. He came for us. And look what he says, verse 46. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. Notice that they took this out to the people. They took it out to the people, all the people. That's, that's just not Christian people. They had favor with all the people. Let me tell you the lie of the devil. The devil says, well, if you go out and tell people about Jesus and you get too fanatical, nobody will like you, you'll have no friends. The Bible says here they had favor with all the people. Being passionate and living for God on purpose did not segregate them from the rest of the world. It actually gave them favor with the rest of the world. Amen. See, the devil always lied to you about that. I told the story whenever I was at East Tennessee State and I'd given my heart to the Lord in the early part of the year and then Bonnie and I got married in August and then the, around the third Sunday of August... Uh, we were there at the church, and I was there, and the football team went. The, the pastor there was the, the chaplain. And so he gave a message, and at the end of the message, gave an invitation for people to come forward. Well, I hadn't gone forward. I just, you know, prayed during the year and committed. I was going to live for the Lord. I was going to quit partying and doing the stuff. And, and, and so that morning, he said, you need to come forward. People need to, you need to come forward. He's given an altar call. Had, had the football team there. Church is packed out. And, and so... I'm sitting there, and the Lord said, I want you to go forward and let everybody know that you've given your heart to me. And I said, I I'm not, don't think I'm not going to do that. And the Lord said, no, you need to go forward. I want you to go forward right now. And I thought, no, nah, I don't want to do that. And, and the devil stepped in about that time. And he said, you go forward, and you'll lose all your friends. You go forward, and the coaches will think you're a sissy. You go forward, and your time as being a football player is over. You, you, they'll, they'll, they'll not have anything to do with you. And by the time the pastor preached, you know, over in Matthew says, Jesus said, if you are ashamed to confess me before this sinful and adulterous generation, I'll not confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. And the pastor said that. And I'm there debating with me and the Lord and the devil are having an argument. Do I listen to the Lord and go forward and let everybody know who I'm standing for? Do I stay in here and stay where I'm at? I, I'm going to lose my friends if I go forward. I'm not going to be part of this team. They're going to ostracize me. I, I'm going to have all kinds of problems if I go forward. The Lord says, don't be ashamed of me. Go forward. I said, Lord, I can live for you standing here. He said, then you're ashamed of me. I said, no, sir, I'm not ashamed of you. I'll go I, I don't want to go forward. He says, go forward. The devil says, don't you go forward. You'll lose your friends. Coaches will think you're a sissy. You'll lose your scholarship. It'll all be over if you go forward. It's going to cost you everything if you go forward. And the pastor recited the verse again. If I won't confess Jesus before people, I'm ashamed of him. And he won't be able to confess me before the Father. And so the Lord said, time to go forward. And I finally said, Lord. He said, go forward. I said, I don't want to be ashamed of you. He said, then go forward. Now, the devil's been telling me I'm going to lose all my buddies if I go forward. But I made up my mind, whatever the cost, I'm going forward, I'm going to live for Jesus. And I stepped out of my pew, came down to the front, and when I stepped out, six of my friends stepped out and came down with me. See, the devil didn't tell me that the Lord was dealing with six others. And each one of my buddies came up to me and said, Huffman, we thank you for going forward because when we saw you go forward, it gave us the courage to go forward. We thought if, if you can go forward, we can do it too. And you know what? I didn't lose friends. I got favor. My coaches came up and shook my hand and said, it took a man to do what you did today. Favor. See, the devil's a liar, folks. And the Holy Ghost will not ever put you in a place where God will not take care of you. Oh, you listen to me. And so they had favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily as many as were being saved. How, the, how were they getting saved? People were telling them about Jesus. 
Why were they telling them about Jesus? Because they had given their hearts to the Lord and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. What is the purpose of the Holy Spirit coming, folks? Yes, you can be filled with the Spirit and you can speak with tongues and you should. But that's not where it stops. You should get filled with the Holy Spirit like Peter did. You should speak in tongues like the Apostle Peter did because he's a part of the 120 that was in the upper room. And the tongues set upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they all spake with other tongues. So the Apostle Peter spoke in other tongues, right? But he didn't stay in the upper room just praying in tongues. He went out and walked in the power of the Holy Spirit and shared Jesus with those that are needing him. So what do we need to do today? We need to give our hearts to the Lord. We need to get filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to receive our prayer language. But at the same time, we need to remember what the purpose of all this is all about. That I am going to live for Jesus Christ on purpose. Now I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you a question. Does the people that you work with on the job, do they know you're a Christian? Do the people in your community, your neighborhood, know that you're a Christian? Do the associates know that you're a Christian? Do family members know that you're a Christian? Do they know what church you attend? Do they know what you believe in? See, we need to ask these questions because the world is needing some light right now. And we're the light bearers. We, we have the light of God. Are you listening to me? God, in John 1 says, there was a man sent from God. He was sent to bear witness of the light. He wasn't the light, but he was sent to bear witness of the light. I'm not the light, but I've got the light living on the inside of me. Hallelujah. And the world needs to see that light. They need to see Jesus. I heard the story, and it's such a sad story. A gentleman came to work on a Monday morning and around break time at 9, 9, 15 he finally mustered up the courage and he told his buddy that he'd been working with for 10 years listen, I need to tell you something it's break time, let me talk to you a minute and his buddy said, yeah, what is it? he goes, well, I don't know what you think about this but I just feel like I need to tell you I went to church this past weekend, and on Sunday morning, the preacher preached about Jesus and salvation. I gave my heart to Jesus, and I'm a Christian, and I'd like to share with you that, that you can be a Christian too. And his buddy looked at him and says, well, I've been a Christian for, for the last 20 years, and, and I gave myself life to the Lord, you know, when I was younger, and, and I go to such and such church. The fellow looked at him with sat and he says you mean you've been working beside me for 10 years and you're a Christian and you was going to let me go to hell that's not a friend my question comes down to what are we all about we had a young man stand up here and share last Sunday how he lost his arm how he got bitter and angry at God and found out it wasn't God that took it. And then God realized that he actually kept him from going to hell. And he gave his heart to Christ. Got filled with the Holy Spirit. Went to Bible school. And now he goes out and tells people about Jesus. Well, yeah, but he's got one arm. Well, you've got to lose an arm before you'll tell somebody about Jesus? You don't want to have to lose an arm to tell somebody about Jesus. Amen? God doesn't require that of you. All the Lord wants you to do is be filled with the Spirit, be excited to know what your purpose is, and live before Him. Let's begin to live this life before God. Amen? Amen. And let's let people all around us know, Jesus is my Lord. But you know, Pastor, if I start telling people about Jesus, they're going to realize I'm not perfect. Newsflash, they already know you're not perfect. Yeah, but they'll think I'm a hypocrite. No, they won't. They'll just think you're not a perfect person that loves Jesus and you're trying to get do the best you can. And they'll respect you for wanting to live for Jesus and trying to live for Jesus than trying to hide it and get by with it. Amen? Listen, folks. Read the Bible. See, this, once again, it's just a lie of the devil. God, when he had the Bible written, gave the good, the bad, and the ugly of all of the people in it. Well, I couldn't do anything for God. Read about King David. You can do something about God. Well, I couldn't do anything for God. Read about Rahab. She went from prostitute to heroine to the lineage of Jesus. So don't tell me you can't do anything for God. 
You can. With all your mess, with all your weaknesses, with all your imperfections, with all your struggles, you can do something for God. And the Holy Spirit will help you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you.